I guess I guess I got first got wind of the war on women. And I don't want to put it in quotes. I've noticed that the media keeps putting war on women in quotes as if they don't want to really take responsibility for saying that there is a war on women. But there is a war on women. There really is. And uh, it seems pretty evident to me. Um, but I, st I really started to uh, key in um, in about March and April when I was following the event national events. Um, and Unite Women, uh, an organization started getting, getting together here in Michigan and they were holding a rally down at the Capitol um, to talk about the war on women. Now it wasn't very well attended. Uh, there were, it was rainy, it was cold, there were just a few people standing out there. Um, but but they were enthusiastic. So uh, I remember when I was giving my speech, you know, there, there were women yelling and I, I thought, wow, this is... Um, we just... I uh, saw the controversy over the Violence Against Women Act, which was first passed in 1994. We're still, it was astonishing that there was any kind of uh, oppo opposition to that act. Uh, <laughs> exactly, yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, and I talked about the history of feminism, but, but I really, I, I wasn't sure that it was going to go anywhere at all. I, I didn't, it didn't feel like we had a force, uh, that we didn't have enough energy, because with social movements, it's, it's hard to tell, uh, even though a very small number of people can start an effective social movement, um, it, it, the conditions have to be right. Um, it's rather like ha what happened with Occupy. You know, it seemed like it was really getting going there, but the conditions were, weren't right, I don't think, for Occupy to be sustained over time. Um, it takes, there are a lot of factors that we don't even know what the factors are that create a successful, successful social movement. If we did, we'd be able to just have one every day. <laughs> so, um, so I wasn't sure. Um, so then, uh, when the Michigan legislature uh, started to move an anti-abortion omnibus bill through the uh, through the House, um, I became really, really alarmed when I heard from Planned Parenthood because I've always felt very strongly in support of Planned Parenthood. I mean, what would women have done without Planned Parenthood and men uh, for you know for a hundred years? So, uh, so the the anti-abortion omnibus bill appeared to be designed to get rid of Planned Parenthood and to get rid of abortion in Michigan. So I knew that that was going on, uh, so I went down to the Capitol when Planned Parenthood had organized a protest. Now, I really had expected to see a few people down there. It was on a weekday, it was in the afternoon, and I thought, how many people can get off work? You know, because you have to have the leisure to be a protester, you know, if you're going to go down during on a weekday. Um, so, uh, so I went down on that day, and much to my surprise, it was it was a very large gathering of people. Um, I think they're now saying it was about 450, which seemed seemed about right. I thought it was about 500, so it seems right that it may have been 450. I mean, it's hard hard to judge crowds, but it was it was significant. And Planned Parenthood had given out pink shirts, and that was brilliant. Um, other movements have done that as well, but what it does is it it makes it makes very visible just how many people, so you don't get lost in a in a crowd of people. But you, you know, when we went, went into the Capitol, everybody knew that these are the people who are supporting Planned Parenthood. So we walked into the Capitol thinking that the anti-abortion omnibus was about to be um, decided by the House. Um, as it turned out, it didn't it didn't occur till the next day, but. Uh, I guess it's not that easy to predict when a bill is going to come up um, because that's just the way the legislature works. There was no conspiracy or anything, which is, I don't think. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so 450 of us flooded into the Capitol. Now some of us went into the gallery and this is kind of wonderful because I think a lot of people who were there that day had never been to the gallery and had never seen the house in operation and suddenly they're getting the civics lesson you know, this is how legis the legislature works. I know I said that I'm wearing pink as well. Uh, to voice their uh, opposition to bills that we'll be taking up since their voice was not heard in the policy committee, uh, I ask everyone to help me join them and I'll welcome them to the House of Representatives today. Well, Uh, 
And, but some of us, and I wasn't able to get into the gallery because there were too many people uh, who had already flooded into the, in, in there. So, we, so the rest of us just stood around the rotunda, which is three tiers high. And in our pink shirts, we, we surrounded the tiers and, um, and everybody, and there were men and women, started to, uh, to slap the wooden banister around the rotunda, making a huge racket. They were stomping and it was chanting. And um, if you go into the, into the uh, gallery and the heavy doors close, it's actually pretty muffled in there. But if you make enough noise out in the rotunda, it enters, it can enter into the gallery, even though that's a pretty muffled space. So I'm sure they heard us. So, uh, so we had that protest and then it kind of, as we discovered that 5711 wasn't really going to be decided that day, people, uh, people kind of uh, filtered out. Um, and then the next day, as it turned out, 5711 was, uh, was passed by the House so that it goes forward to the Senate. And that bill is, uh, is pretty awful because um, it, um, it really uh, puts uh, these requirements on clinics that they're, that they're not going to be able to meet. Um, they're doing the same thing with voter suppression. Uh, they're putting so many burdens on on, for example, the League of Women Voters to try to register people to vote that they're not going to be able to do it. So the idea is to just put so much, so much extra baggage on these things that, uh, that, that uh, you know, people aren't able to, to do these things. So, um, so uh, on Wednesday we heard that HB 5711 had gone through. 5712 and 5713, which were the two other bills that related to the anti-abortion omnibus that were on the, they were tabled. And the rumor was that Governor Snyder had gone behind the scenes because he didn't really want to be dealing with this issue and had those uh, suppressed. Um, but uh, on Thursday then, uh, the uh, decision had come on the Wednesday, um, a lot of people came out again, about 100 people, even though there wasn't really anything, it was just to make a stand on 5711. So, when, so everybody came in their pink shirts that they had been issued <laughs> and Planned Parenthood, for those who didn't have them, Planned Parenthood uh, had provided them. Uh, so once again, we all went into the gallery and this time I got into the gallery, so I was watching Jace Bolger, who was the uh, House Speaker um, uh, uh, determining the events on the floor. And uh, when we walked in, uh, we we pretty much surrounded the gallery. There were, as I said, there were about a hundred of us. And so we started watching the proceedings in the house and we were really uh, shocked at, <laughs> at the way that, the, the, that these things were going because they, there had seemed to be little discussion. There seemed to be things raced through that, that needed discussion. I was sitting next to a, a woman whose mother was also there and who was a retired teacher who watched as the house uh, chipped away at teachers' pensions, and she was furious. And her daughter said to me, "Well, this is this is her issue too, <laughs> you know that there, and uh, and the sense uh, that there were a bunch of there's a bunch of legislation and, uh, aimed at women started to really hit us. I think you know that there was a broad base of of an attack on women. I mean, you know, the voter suppression laws, that's, that's the League of Women Voters. That's, a, that's an organization that was founded by women. Then you had the anti-abortion omnibus, you had, and the House uh, was not moving on bills for preventative care or, or the positive, or pay equity or bills that are really positive for women. So, so uh, uh, you know, we started to, to think through these kinds of issues. And I was really, I was really pleased to hear that the local now was, was, uh, was getting revitalized. And that was really exciting to me because I remember now from the 70s and how important they were uh, for that uh, second wave of fighting that we did where we got all those gains. So it was really nice to hear that now, now was coming back um, in response to the really nationwide uh, assault on women that I think is going on. Um, so I was sitting in the coffee shop waiting uh, for those folks when one of the young women from Planned Parenthood, which had its, the, the advocates for Planned Parenthood had their office upstairs, she came down and she said, there's going to be a press conference uh, in a few minutes and would you join us? Because she saw that I had a pink shirt on. Uh, she said, because Lisa Brown and Barbara Byram have been censored by the House. 
have not asked you to adopt and adhere to my religious beliefs. Why are you asking me to adopt yours? And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'm flattered that you're all so interested in my vagina, but no means no. And I, was, and I thought, what? <laughs> How could this be? And, I, and, I, and as she explained it to me, I thought, well, they've just, they've just met their, they've just reached their nadir because this is going to blow up in their face. I knew it as soon as this young woman told me this because uh, when you start taking away people's speech rights, that people know that that is un-American. <laughs> You know, that that is a right that is deeply, deeply held uh, by citizens in this country. And they don't like, and women have never liked being, uh, being silenced. Um, so um, I went to the press conference, and it was in a very small room in the Capitol. And it was just, it was Lisa Brown, Barbara Byram, a few other of the women Democratic legislators, and uh, a few supporters, and then a few people from uh, in their pink Planned Parenthood shirts there too. And then there were just a few uh, reporters standing across uh, who were uh, listening. And one of them was a guy who just, he kept smirking <laughs> through the, throughout as if this was the least important thing in the world, you know, and that he, and uh, it was, he, he just irritated me so much. But anyway, so Barbara Bar Byram and Lisa Brown talked to them. Um, and as I said, it was small, but by that night, the whole thing had blown up huge in the national press. I guess because, I guess because Barbara Byron tweeted something, <laughs> but she was mad, and so the, they, were, they were angry. Um, and uh, what they had said on the House floor was strong. It was, it was they used strong images. Um, they were using techniques that I think other women legislators are using across the country, which is Barb Byram uh, was uh, trying to put in, an amendment on the bill that would say that, that men's vasectomy should be regulated. Well, women legislators in other places are doing that too, just to try to point out the absurdity of what's going on in these kinds of bills. Uh, when the press picked this up, it, it had just like every dimension that, that would make a news, media newsworthy story. Uh, it had the speech issue. Um, it had the word vagina, uh, which you know people were feeling. Ooh, I you know we can say this, and this they're sort of. Uh, I, I think that was part of the of the play that the whole thing got in the media. And in fact, um, as this thing has, as the thing was perpetuated over the next week, the the commentary in the press became more and more about just saying the word vagina. You know, can we say this in the media? Can we you know where can we say this? Which actually got away from the original issue. And I know there was some concern about that amongst the, the people who are um, quite interested in HB 5711. <laughs> you, know, this, you know, okay, this is great, but, but we do need to get back to the legislation at hand. Um, but that really became quite huge. And then, and then Lisa Brown is quite wonderful uh, as a presence. Um, and so she got picked up and she appeared on these news uh, shows and, and she was quite vocal there as well uh, in a really uh, winning way. And so I think because she has a bit of charisma uh, in, a, in her own way, <laughs> that, that, that that helped too, because she looks good on camera, she spoke well, um, and she was, she was quite a firebrand. So Maddow had her and then uh, uh, other news organs picked that up um, and it really became even an international story because it really, uh, from what I saw when I was looking at the, the aggregators, it was in the Spanish language news, it was in the Italian language news. Um, so, um, and in fact, there was a little bit of commentary in the Spanish language press as well, which I am still translating. But, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of commentary across the country in newspapers, you know, people were really interested, and especially I think in states where they're also uh, facing similar kinds of issues, uh, that newspapers uh, editorialized about this um, and then reflected on what was going on in their own states. So I think it really became uh, a rallying, a rallying cry for women across the country, and you know, and also for men. Now I, I have to say that I, I think it's kind of sad that probably in the past. 20 years, young women have become more and more reluctant to say that they're feminists. 
um, it became associated in the public mind with saying that you hated men. And so young women don't want to say, well, I, I hate men. <laughs> so it was a very simplistic uh, uh, way of thinking about this long history of the women's rights movement. So I, I've had many students in, you know, in my time over the past 20 years to say, well, I believe in women's rights, I mean, I believe in women's equality, but I, I wouldn't call myself a feminist. But now I think just uh, in the past, well, really few weeks for me, I'm seeing a really, as, as there's an assault on health care, as there is an assault on issues that are really uh, important to women, I'm seeing, again, I think maybe some small seeds of perhaps another surge of, of a women's rights movement, so. amazing because that just took a couple of people here in Michigan who had a brilliant idea to, to call Eve Ensler, um, who had written the Vagina Monologues. Now I remember that that play from way back. I mean this is, it's been around for a long time and uh, I, I actually you know and when it was on campus I, I took my women's studies students to see it. You know? <laughs> Oh, this was a wonderful place for Eve Esler to come. I mean, this is her thing, you know, that, that you say vagina, that you talk about vaginas, because if you don't, you know, bad things can happen to your vagina, <laughs> right? So, uh, so um, when I heard that, the, the, and they organized it in just a couple of days. I mean, I first thought that they were gonna have it on the Friday, which is just like a day, basically <laughs> two days after the whole thing had happened. <laughs> Um, but they ended up having it on the Monday. But um, uh, the, the rapid organization was, was just incredible. And uh, the fact that it took place on the Capitol steps was brilliant. The whole thing was, who had ever seen anything like this before? You know, I'm sure that the Vagina Monologues has never been performed on any Capitol steps anywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's been performed in a lot of places. It's internationally known. It's been translated into many languages, but I'm sure that it's never been performed on a Capitol steps. So, and not only that, but then they had the women legislators in it, not just Brown and Byron, but uh, you know, the other, the other women who had, uh, who had fought against uh, HP 5711. And they were actually in the play. I mean, one of them looked rather uncomfortable. <laughs> I won't say who, um, but uh, but uh, Lisa Brown and Barbara Byram, I thought did a brilliant job, you know, in in their roles. Uh, uh, they didn't have long roles, but they but they they carried it off beautifully. And um, so there was the vagina monologues on the Capitol steps, talking about vaginas in these rich and complicated ways, you know, about uh, about violence, about pleasure, about all of these things. It was it was a robust crowd. Uh, of men and women uh, who were actually at points in in this production shouting vagina at the Capitol. And uh, it was not only vagina that was set on the Capitol steps, but it was also like clitoris that was set on the Capitol steps. And uh, I actually was tweeting this for Lansing Area Now, um, even though I was not very proficient at tweeting and I had never done much of it before, but I thought, well, th this has to go out. I, I have to get my perspective out through, through tweeting, so I tweeted the thing. So, uh, but it was, it was great fun and, and, and just, I think this has to go down in history as, as a, a major event. Uh, it's in the women's movement. It's, because there was never anything like it before. And uh, social movements that can really use art, that can use visual media, that can use theater, that can use song, that can use all these things, uh, they're, they, they can really uh, gain a lot of force, I think. And um, with Occupy, a lot of their uh, images that they used uh, uh, were, were from the old uh, 60s anti-war movie. They picked up a lot of their iconography from that, and I think it was kind of stale, and so they got accused in the press of just being hippies or whatever. You know, they, it could be said about them. So uh, it's it's important, I think, if you're going to have a, a viable social movement, to be able to to come up with the unexpected, and this was really, really the unexpected. And the word vagina now, it's on posters. It's people, women are and men are singing songs, but they're writing songs about it. They're, they're, uh, they're saying it in all these, these different places, and uh, so uh, uh, um, it's just, it was a really amazing thing. And so at the end of it, then Eva Ensler said, um, 
vagina voices vote, which I think it was, it's succinct, it's a beautiful slogan that can be easily carried, you know, just like the word vagina was easily carried as a kind of symbol uh, of a movement, that that, that that slogan too can be easily carried as a symbol. So um, this is, this is really, I'm excited about this. I think this is real. <laughs> I was speculating on why so many young women turn out for the first protest because usually when I've been at, at protests at the Capitol, it's been the usual suspects, <laughs> you know? and we're gray, you know. Uh, but I think because women have used Planned Parenthood, it's they're the ones who are facing issues with contraception. They're the ones who are facing these these issues with abortion. So. Uh, I, and I think that the fact that, that Planned Parenthood had reached so many young people that they were willing to turn out for Planned Parenthood, and then I think they may have started to get an education uh, in just how drastic things might be. Now, um, I think we need everybody uh, fighting this fight, um, that uh, us gray hairs can certainly, you know, br bring our experience with organizing. Uh, we have women who've been um, really fighting in the trenches for a long time. I mean, it's not like this hasn't been going on for a long time. It's just that women have been working in isolations in small groups, uh, you know, uh, uh, women's health advocates, the now lobbyists. They have all been fighting this fight, and they've been doing it by themselves, which uh, that really became clear to me that, that that these women have, have had such strength in, in keeping the fight going, but now uh, they need support, and I think that that's being seen now. They need, they need resources, they need bodies, they need energy to help them carry the fight forward so that we can be successful in this. Uh, I, think it, I think it's, since so many women are, this is important to so many women, uh, pay equity is important to women, contraception is important to women, abortion is important to women, you know, these things are all very important to women, that, uh, that even moderate, those with moderate political views or even conservative women can understand that this is quite important and directly related to their lives. So, uh, so um, uh, I'm th you know, I, yes, the legislation is impending and we have a few weeks of a law, uh, but I, d I don't think that the energy is going to go away. I, in fact, um, a couple of days from now, there's supposed to be everybody, everybody on, there's like 30,000 people signed up for this event on Facebook that they're going to change their picture to a flower or something to represent a vagina, or we were wondering if they were actually going to put their <laughs> pictures of their vaginas up, that they were going to change their names to, to something. Um, so uh, uh, I, there, there's still like huge interest, you know, and especially like a, an easy, you know, people, that's easy, right? That's not like going and calling a legislator, which also needs to be done. Um, but it's, it's an easy way for people to, to make a, a statement, I think. So, <laughs> but that keeps it energized, keeps it energized. And a hat. So I knew that the vagina monologues was coming, and I also like the spirit of social, the artistic spirit of social movements a lot. I'm very attracted to that. I, I, I love the creativity that spills out of a new social movement. So I thought that I wanted to participate in that. And even though I am not a craft person, <laughs> I, I don't sit around making crafts, <laughs> but I just had this moment of, of inspiration, and I thought I'm going to make a hat, and I'm going to put like vaginas all over it. So I went and bought this this hat uh, at Target, this pink lovely hat, which <laughs> I would not be, normally be caught dead in. Um, and then I took felt and I made these, these, little, these little forms. And uh, what, what I was trying to do was make it so subtle that if you didn't know the context, you wouldn't be able to tell what they were. But if you did, were in the know, you'd be able to tell. So, <clears throat> so this is the hat that I, uh, that I wore to the vagina monologues and um, uh, young women really like this hat. They kept stopping me and, and taking pictures of my hat. Uh, so, so I was sort of hoping to start a fashion movement where, where we would uh, where we would have these, these hats at every, at every protest. And now I'm now wearing this hat to every women's protest I go to. So Well, you know what I, I think of it? I mean, I, who knew that a vagina would become a meme? <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> 
what's really funny. This is there's there's this uh, because uh, uh, when when we, women were saying vagina, there were uh, some naysayers who would come out and say, "You're not. That isn't really a vagina. That's a vulva." And there was this <laughs> this bizarre discussion whether you know you're not right in saying vagina. You have to, you know. <laughs> ways that that the uh that the thing was being refuted was was really quite hilarious so <laughs>